better apologize to our custodian, Dick, because there's still a lot of uh, candy wrappers up front. <laughs> I didn't think they were going to eat them right now. I guess it should be better. Let's, uh, let's turn to God and let's ask his blessing on his word to us uh, this morning. Our Father and our God, we are hungry to know you better. We want to hear this story again in a way that will challenge us, comfort us, and encourage us. We pray that you would do that this morning through your word. We trust in the work of the Holy Spirit who makes clear to us that which was, would otherwise be out of our grasp. And Lord, I ask too that you would speak through these words to us, that you would use me as, as the instrument to speak to each one of us here today. And you will receive the glory and the honor in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, friends of Jesus Christ, and you, well, when I was back in middle school, um, I was a high jumper. At least I did for a couple seasons. I was on the high jump for the track team now. I'm six feet tall now, so that maybe doesn't seem so un unlikely, but when I was at that age, I was the smallest kid in the class. And so it was a really odd thing for me to be in high jump. But I signed up for it, and the coach told me, he said, well, because you are so short, um, if you're going to succeed at this, he said, you need to make sure that you focus on running. You've got to be able to run really fast so that you can take that forward momentum and turn it upward and over. And it was good advice because if I can brag for just a little bit, I got second place when I competed. That was a big deal for a shrimpy little kid like me. So forward momentum, he said, a running start is going to be your key to doing well. And I think that actually is good advice for us this morning as we look at these two passages, one from the Gospel of John and then one from the book of Hebrews. If we really want to sink our teeth into these words and really want to hear them and understand we need a good running start. And actually, a good running start that goes all the way back to the book of Genesis. Now, I know that sounds more like a marathon start than a running start, but, but hear me out. We've got to go back to the very beginning of time because just as the Gospel of John tells the story of the resurrection and, and makes it clear to us that Jesus' resurrection took place in a garden, if we go all the way back to the beginning of time, we find ourselves, as you know, in another garden. We find ourselves back in the Garden of Eden, and in the Garden of Eden, as you know, Adam and Eve were placed, God placed Adam and Eve in, in, there in the garden, and in addition to the flowers and the plants and the trees and the fruits and the vegetables and everything else that goes along with the garden, one of the main features of the Garden of Eden was that Adam and Eve enjoyed the presence of God. They enjoyed intimacy with God. They enjoyed closeness with God. The whole purpose, or one of the main purposes of the garden was it was a place for Adam and Eve to enjoy close communion, close friendship with God. And you know that in the Garden of Eden, God says to Adam and Eve, if you want to enjoy the blessings and the benefits and the joys of this garden, there's one thing you need to obey. Don't take fruit from that one tree. Right? You remember that? That's Sunday school, right? You hear that? Don't touch the tree. Don't take fruit from that one tree. You can eat from all the others, but obey me about that one tree. And for Adam and Eve to continue to enjoy the delights of the garden, to continue to enjoy that close relationship with God, to continue to enjoy the presence of God, it all depended on them obeying that command about the tree. I think we all know how that happened. Adam and Eve, they disobeyed God in the garden. They didn't listen, they took the fruit they were not supposed to take, and God then expelled them from the garden. He sent them outside of the garden. And you may remember, it's, it's the last couple of verses of Genesis chapter 3. God puts an angel at the entrance to the garden. You remember that? And, and the angel standing there with the, with the flashing sword, 
And that angel is preventing, the, uh, preventing Adam and Eve from going back into the Garden of Eden. Adam and Eve could not re-enter the presence of God. To enter the presence of God again would mean going through the sword. It would mean going through death. And so it was, in that sense, impossible for Adam and Eve. Returning to God's presence meant going through the sword. And now we can fast forward hundreds, a couple of thousand years later to the time of Christ. And we come and we find ourselves in a second garden. In the fullness of time, God sends his son, Jesus, who is sometimes called in the New Testament the second Adam. The son of God who is commanded again by God, obey me. Do my will, but in this case, doing God's will, doing the will of the Father meant going to the cross. For Jesus to obey the will of the Father it meant to go all the way to death. God told the first Adam and Eve, if you obey me about the tree, you will live. If you obey me about the tree, you will flourish, you will thrive, you will continue to enjoy my presence. God says to the second Adam, Jesus, if you obey me about the tree, you will die. You will experience me forsaking you. And Jesus, even though obedience meant death, Jesus obeys. Jesus succeeds where the first Adam failed. Jesus obeys where the first Adam disobeyed. Jesus goes through the sword. Jesus goes through death. Jesus pays the price to regain fellowship, to regain relationship with God. And so when John tells us the and when John tells us the story of the resurrection, he tells us something very significant. He tells us in, in uh, John chapter 20 verse 12 that Mary looks into the tomb. And when Mary looks into the tomb, she sees two angels. She sees one seated at the, at the place where Jesus' head would have been, and a second angel seated where, the, where Jesus' feet would have been. And what John is doing very intentionally here, he's calling to mind this picture here. Now, thinking, what in the world is this? If you were here last week, you remember, this is a picture of what the Ark of the Covenant would have looked like. And the Ark of the Covenant is where God's presence dwelled among his people. But the Ark of the Covenant was in Israelite times, it was kept off limits. Only the priest could enter in. Only the priest could experience the manifestation and the visible presence of God. The Ark of the Covenant, God's presence was there above the angels, but it was off limits. Well, now what John is doing is he's showing and he's calling to mind this picture of the Ark of the Covenant. He's really saying the presence of God is here again. An angel at the head, an angel at the, at the foot of where Jesus was laid. But this time, the angels are not restricting the access to God. This time, the angels are not keeping God's presence off limits. The angels are inviting. You can say it like this. The angels are saying, because Jesus has gone through the sword, because Jesus has gone to death, come now and experience the presence of God. The angel that used to guard the presence of God, the angel that used to restrict God's presence, now the angels are saying, you can come and experience God's presence. And if you look now at the book of Hebrews, I told you we'd be going quickly. This is a running start. Now you get to the book of Hebrews, and the writer of Hebrews interprets this for us. In Hebrews um, chapter 10, the writer begins this way. He says, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place, to say it very simply, because Jesus has gone for us through death, because Jesus has conquered death, we now live and we are now invited to experience the presence of God. And because of what Jesus has done, the presence of God is open to us. It's open to us. The angels don't guard God's presence, the angels welcome us into God's presence. And furthermore, the writer says in verse 21 that we have Jesus as a high priest, as our representative, our representative who stands on our behalf before God. 
and pleads our case for us and says, that person there, no matter what he or she has done, no matter what's in their past, my blood, my sacrifice on the cross covers them. When we place our trust in Jesus Christ and we, we embrace him as Lord and Savior, and Jesus becomes our representative. His blood covers us. And Jesus stands before God on our behalf. He says, my work covers them. They are mine. They belong to me. That's in a nutshell the meaning of Easter. We have access to God's presence. Because Jesus has gone through the sword, we are invited to experience God's presence. Now the, the question is, if you believe this, if, if, you, if you believe that this is true, if you're convinced that this is certain, what difference does that make for you? How do we live different? Because we have access to God's presence. How do we live different because Jesus has gone through the sword for us? How do we live differently because of Easter? And that's what the writer of Hebrews then goes forward, and that's what he wants to unpack. That's what he wants to explain. He says, you notice how he structures this, this passage. He says, because we have access to God's presence, and because we have a high priest, then let us, let us, let us. He says three things. Let us, and actually structures it around faith, hope, and love. Because we have access to God's presence, let us live in faith, let us live in hope, let us live in love. Now what does that look like? What does that look like for you and for I? How do we live in faith and hope and love? Well, that's, let's take a look at what the writer tells us. If you have your Bible still open, first look at verse 22, Hebrews 10, verse 22. Because we have confidence to enter God's presence, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart in full assurance of faith. Let us draw near to God with full assurance of faith. You know, back in the Old Testament times, when the priest had to go into God's presence, I've said this a couple of times, I'll just repeat it briefly, it was a terrifying thing. And the priest only entered into God's presence after much careful preparation and rituals and ceremonies. And then even when he went into God's presence, there was a, a, there was a sense of dread. There was a sense that if, if there was something that was not done correctly, if he had made some mistake, that could cost him his life. It was a terrifying thing to enter the holy and awesome presence of God. And it occurs to me that, that there's a sense in which people experience... God's presence that way as well. And I, maybe it's not true for you, but maybe it is. There are some people, when they think about what it is to, to have God's presence with them, it, it, it's a very frightening thing in the sense that, well, they envision God as sort of a person who's like a, a, a police officer who's always there to try to catch them doing something wrong. The presence of God is, is with us, they say, but you know what? He's, he's just there and he's waiting to, to catch us in the act. He's just there to condemn us when we make a mistake. And, and he's always on our back. He's always enforcing the rules and enforcing the morals. And when we fall short, he's right there. And God has experienced as, as, as sort of an angry judge or, like I said, a police officer. Some people have grown up with that. Some people experience the church that way. They come into church and the church is just full of angry people who want to tell everyone what is wrong with their lives. And it's no wonder then that there are people that really want nothing to do with God. They just get tired of feeling God is always on their back to catch them and judge them. But what the writer of Hebrews is saying is that Jesus has experienced the condemnation, the judgment in our place. That's all taken away from us when we embrace Jesus as Lord and Savior. And when we do, then we can have confidence that, yes, God is with us, He's watching over us, He's caring for us, but He's doing so with the heart and love of a father, with the care of a shepherd. God wants them to, to shape us and change us and mold us so that we become more and more like Him, so that we become Christ-like. The presence of God in our lives is there to sustain us and to strengthen us and to care for us. We can have hope and we can have confidence in that. Some of us Maybe there's still something in your life, something that still kind of lingers, some lingering guilt over something. I hear more often than you think that people, I did it happen way a long time ago. 
and the guilt is still there. The shame, the sense of inadequacy, the sense of, well, God can't love me, and he must love me less, or I'm not good enough. Hebrews says we have a clean conscience. We can approach God with faith in Christ and know that God looks at us through the work of Jesus Christ. Our conscience is clean. So we can delight in God's presence in our lives. Maybe to apply this specifically, when we think about some of the ways that we experience God's presence, things like prayer, scripture reading, corporate worship, personal worship, all these things. You know, sometimes we, we I don't know, we, we treat these things like they're sort of a chore or a duty. I've got to do this, I've got to go to church, I've got to read my Bible. Every, and, and, Sometimes, yeah, it's a discipline. Sometimes you maybe you don't want to, you've got to just stick with the discipline. But boy, I hope that for us we see the delight in being able to experience and pray to God directly, being able to listen to his word and listen to him speak to us. What a joy that is. What a delight to experience God's presence in that way. Second thing. Verse 23, take a look at what it says to us. Hebrews 10, 23. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess. Why? For he who promised is faithful. Hope. Let's hold unswervingly to the hope we profess. You know, it occurs to me that our... Our world today is longing for hope. You get that sense? You have that sense too when you see things on the news, see what's happening in other parts of the world. You see famine, you see disease, you see entire countries just devastated by civil war. And then you even look closer to home. You see people, maybe that you know personally, whose lives are just in pieces right now. They've gone through something that's just torn them up, and the effects of it are just devastating. It could be any number of things. It could be a loss of a relationship. It could be a face-to-face -face encounter with death. It could be any number of things. The world is longing for hope. And it strikes me that Christians, you and I, are not always known as the go-to people for hope. And I'm not saying that's true for everyone all the time. I'm not saying that you know we're all cynical or bitter, but I'm saying that sometimes Christians have the reputation. And if we're honest, we have to admit that there's at least a kernel of truth in it that we're known more for pointing out everything that's wrong with the world. Am I right about that? I mean, you, you notice that sometimes we're, we're known as for, for singling out all the problems and all the ways people are just not living right and, and this world is falling apart and this world is, is in pieces. And I, I, I read a, it was in, I guess maybe Dear Ann Landers or whatever the column is in the, in the Statesman. And it's about a, some woman wrote in and she just said something like this. You know what? I wish we could just bottle up the 1950s and bring them back to today. And I thought, well, that's an interesting way to put it, for one thing. But then I thought, you know, I think, I think that's a common sentiment. You know, if we could just get back to the way things once were, this world would be such a better place. And to a degree, I understand that. But on the other hand, Christians are called to be people who live in hope. When Jesus, when, when, when God raised Jesus from the dead, he sent a message that the power of sin and death have been defeated. He made clear that a new world is being born, a resurrected world that will ultimately be transformed and will culminate in the coming of the new heavens and the new earth. This world is being made new again. There's hope. Why? Because God is faithful. God is going to finish what he started on Easter morning. There's hope. There's hope. This world is being made new again. And that means that for you and I, our lives have purpose. We're not put in this world to wait out the clock and count down the seconds until this world just falls apart and we can be pulled up to heaven and let the rest of the world just fall apart in flames. That's not what this is about. 
We are called to play a part in the renewal that God is bringing in this world today. And your life has purpose in that plan. Whatever it is that you're doing, whether you're in business, whether you're in education, whether you're a student, whether you're retired, your life has purpose. There's hope. And even the power of death. One of the greatest enemies, the greatest enemy, death itself. The Christian can stand in the face of death and join Paul in saying, where is your sting? Where is your victory? Because even death has been defeated. Christians have hope even in the face of death. Because God is faithful. God is faithful. Hold fast to your hope. Hold fast to your hope. And then finally, finally, take a look at verses 24 and 25. Now, translations put this a little differently, but the bottom line is this. Let us consider how we can spur one another on toward love and good deeds. And I think then the, verse 25 adds a second let us, and that really, I think, fits better under the first sentence so that it would say something like this. Let us not give, or uh, let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as is in the habit of some. In other words, the second sentence kind of should be a part of the first, I think, but minor point. Here's what this means. The writer, is, the writer of Hebrews is addressing a congregation, a group of people, and some of them for reasons that we don't know exactly, it doesn't tell us here, but they they just stopped living as part of the body. They stopped participating in the life of the local church. Now, right away, I know, I guess I could say, okay, trust the pastor to bring this up, right? You're going to tell people to come to church more often. That's not really, that, that's part of this, okay? I'm not, not going to let you off that easy. That's, that's part of what's going on here. But what the writer of Hebrews wants us to see is something bigger. The writer of Hebrews is saying, look, as if, if you're neglecting participating in the life of the church, you, you might not be fully grasping what the resurrection means for us. Let me say it this way. When you become a Christian, you embrace Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you gain access to the presence of God. It's not just an individual thing. It's not just a ticket to heaven when you die. You become a part of a new family. You become part of this new community that God is piecing together. You become part of the community of people that is shaped by the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. You become people shaped by this and, and, and governed by this. Um, in other words, the church is, is, is a gathering of people that not only come together for worship, I mean, we do that, it's a big part of it, but we're also a gathering of people who eat meals together, who attend events together, who just enjoy being with one another. That's part of it. And then, then the second part to what that looks like, he says this, he says, let's consider how we might spur one another on toward love and good deeds. He's saying the community of believers, the church, is a gathering of people who share life together, but who also look for ways to help one another grow in their Christian living. Now, it's interesting, there are two parts to this. He says, the first word, he says, how we might spur one another on. That word, spur one another on, is only used, I think, a time or two, maybe three times in the New Testament. It's not a very popular, very common word. And it usually has a, a, has a negative connotation to it, and just spur, I mean, if you think of it, if you're, I'm not into horses, I don't ride, but I, spurs are, strikes me, they're the pointy things that you dig into the side of the horse to, to make the horse move, right? I mean, I think that's what they are, and that's kind of painful. And what the writer of Hebrews is saying here is, is, is as Christians, as the body of Christ, we spur each other on. It's, it's it's like if you have a rock in your shoe, and you, every step you take, it's there, it's reminding you, you know what? We need people in our life like that. We need people in our life who can say, listen, every time you talk about your spouse in public, you're putting them down. And that's not, that's not right. We need people who can say, listen, I've noticed that you're really, you're struggling with something. We need people who can be honest with us and open with us and say, what you're doing isn't, it's going to hurt you. 
It's going to cause damage to you. It's going to cause damage to the people you love. We need people in our lives like that. I know that runs, that's countercultural today. We're, we don't like to offend people. We don't like to step on each other's toes. But we need people who can spur us on. There's a positive side to that too. The writer of Hebrews is, is careful to draw that out. He says we also need to be encouraging one another on all the more as we see the day approaching. We need people who can be there with us when we experience the loss of a loved one. We need people who can sit in a hospital room, in a waiting room with us and hold our hands while we wait to hear from the doctor. We need people who can identify gifts and talents that we have and say, you know what, you are really good at this, and, and how can you use that to serve God? We need the people who can encourage us and spur us on towards love and good deeds. It was N.T. Wright, who's a, a British scholar, writer, pastor, churchman, he said this, not long ago, he said this, the church should be in reality what people say the world should look like in theory. Did you get that? The church should be in reality what people say the world should look like in theory. The world is, is longing for this kind of a community. The world is, is longing for hope. It's longing to know God again, it's longing to be restored to the garden and the hope and the joy of fellowship with God. The world is longing for relationships that can both challenge us, up, challenge us and build us up. The resurrection makes that happen. The resurrection is God's defeat of sin and death in this world. The resurrection is the beginning of faith and hope and love. Are you living that out? Are you practicing that? Do you have that hope? Do you have that? Are you living by faith? Are you practicing that love? We have access to God who makes it possible for us. Embrace Jesus, the risen Lord and Savior, and live by faith, hope, and love. Let's pray. Our Father and our God, we... We celebrate the victory that Jesus has won over sin and death. He went through the sword for us. He went through death in order to bring us back into your presence. He went through death so that we might know life. He went through death that we might enjoy you with us. Lord, help us to live in faith in what you have done for us. Help us to be people who live by hope that this world is being made new again. Help us to be people who love one another fully and completely, even as you have loved us. Or maybe there are people here that just aren't quite sure what this yet means for them or where they stand. Lord, I pray that you'd be working in their hearts and minds too to challenge them and to comfort them and to draw them to yourself. I pray these things and I ask them in Jesus' name. Amen.